My name is Mike Falk. I'm a software engineering manager at Red Hat. Um, I got invited here indirectly. Uh, one of my co-workers actually was in Nashville with visiting folks in Little Rock for the coffee shop and met Connor, who I've never met. And they started talking about Red Hat because he had a great Red Hat for an And I think you should have someone come and speak to him. Uh, Wesley was actually very excited. He wanted to come. Yeah. And he was like, how can I buy down there? Really pumped about the ACM chapter here in Great Art. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, mostly focus on unit testing, but I'm going to talk about sort of things that I don't think most people uh, come across uh, during their college education of computer science uh, students, things that we do in the industry and develop the software technology. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Red Hat, although I'm happy to do so. And most of my direct team, uh, I mean, I'm a manager. I used to be an engineer, but I'm a manager, so um, I'm talking about the guys that they know what I'm talking about. Um, where I work remote, um, so, uh, I work in my houses, I have a place in North Carolina, uh, all local folks. Am I speak up for Speak up a little bit? Okay. Eric Andrews. Well, let me give an introduction about my pathway to where I'm at. Um, I'm actually from Arkansas, I'm from Conway, uh, office cat. When I was in junior high, I got my first computer, a Commodore Pet um, 32K. That was the max they had on those at the time. Started learning basic then. Um, and been involved with computers since then. I stayed around in Conway College, went to Hendricks. We were talking about mascots. Hendricks at the time was just an H. They were up the Warrior when we had nothing. And they came back. And they have a Warrior now that was a lot like Mel Dixon. I studied physics at uh, Hendricks. Um, when I finished that, I wanted to go to grad school. I wanted to be involved with programming because I enjoyed programming. Um, so I ended up going to Oklahoma State University initially in theoretical laser physics. Um, at the time, nonlinear dynamics was a big thing, strange attractors, all that sort of non-predictable stuff. Um, I didn't like it that much, um, the simulations. Uh, I published one paper and decided I was more interested in what this other guy was doing at OSU with uh, biological systems. So I changed groups and studied cell membranes, the simulation of cell membranes, I basically lipid bilayers as a model. I uh, leveraged that to get a postdoc at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, that was actually a joint appointment with the physics department, the physiology department, the cell membrane stuff, and uh, NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. They created Mosaic, that became Netscape, and all that stuff. I happened to be there on July, uh, January 12, 1997, which as we all know is the birthday of Pal. At Illinois, they actually had a big party with a cow cake on that day. A nice fictitious birthday party with a cow cake. At this point, I had decided I really liked programming. I liked physics, but the day-to-day -day programming I liked more. I posed papers, I went to conferences. That was fun. It was a nice sense of completion. But the buildup of that work was much more tedious, ironically, than coding and debugging and writing and analysis stuff. Um, that uh, salary ranges and the desire to get back closer to family here in Arkansas led me to leave academics and go to all tele information systems. So this is what became Fidelity Information Systems over there. Over there at the 430 in Cantrell. <coughs> it was the banking software, so it wasn't the cellular stuff. It was all retail banking software. Um, I was there two years, jumped over to Axiom. I was at Axiom for seven years. Um, and Axiom started in Java and this open source project, uh, JBoss, is a Java application server, and leveraged that and some connections uh, to a Red Hat. So I was at Red Hat for a year doing support on the JBoss Middle Warrior stuff, and this was kind of a dumb move. I was just over to EMC. They opened a research office in downtown Conway. That was a relationship they had with Axiom. Uh, a couple of these guys did the same thing, and that turned out not to work out very well. Uh, so, fortunately, 
uh, a year later. I, Over the span, um, and I had several different languages with ASIC. Um, most of this stuff was uh, C, Fortran. Um, so I did a little Perl coming into here. Um, did a big jump uh, to visual basic. Then uh, <clears throat> back here to more uh, Unix systems and Java, primarily, obviously, JBoss. Lots of Java, still some Java, and then Java into an almost Python. Another transition that goes here that I think is useful when I talk about some of the techniques and approaches we take to software development is uh, when I want to distinguish, well, I want to distinguish amateur code versus professional code. My amateur, I don't necessarily mean bad. I mean, it's just not honing all of the details. But I still write amateur code all the time. Like that little script where I'm trying to learn how something works. Um, if I throw away things, and I'm using this stuff for something real quick to see what's going on. So that's amateur. I don't document it. I don't worry about it. the unit test we'll talk about. I don't worry about other people having to maintain it. So mm -hmm. this, in junior high, definitely was an amateur code. Right? I didn't know what I was doing. But, um, moving into here, the simulation code that I was worked on was important that it had to be correct, and I had to be able to maintain it. But no one else had to be able to maintain it. So there was some increase in professionalism there. Um, but it wasn't quite the same as making a jump to work with companies where had customer facing revenue generating types of growth. So this becomes the more professional now. So we're going to talk about some of the professional things, what I think are professional things to do when you create a software. Um, so only downstairs is easy and coding is like falling downstairs. And so, you know, the, the whole idea here, here is falling downstairs is easy, right? But falling downstairs is uh, not ever any really fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, this, this metaphor of falling downstairs actually got from Jesse sitting over there. We were coding together and he went through some terrible, painful experience and he said, this fell down downstairs. I really like that view <laughs> of. Uh, that mode of software development, or lack thereof. Now let's talk about what that means in, in the terms of code construction here. So there's a very simple falling down, slipping on stairs, which is typos and syntax errors. And it's one of those things that you just can't, your fingers don't seem to work. Right? And everybody knows that frustration. It's like, oh, I can't find that back. But then you get into the compiler errors, the runtime errors, particularly the ones that you don't understand what they mean. You move on a false path because you think you know what it means. Right? What is this telling me? Oh, it means this problem, and you can't figure out how that could possibly be. Misunderstood APIs, new framework, or web framework, the database ORM framework. How does it work? What are the behaviors? What are the gotchas? Does it make a copy? Does it use a reference? Those kinds of things that can be very hard to uh, figure out. Um, so you started, and then debugging in the sense of those false trails. You start. Uh, I was one of these bad or misunderstood runtime messages, error messages, you go down a false path debugging and just kind of get which one. So that's falling downstairs, particularly that cascading is just one thing after another, after another, you try that, oh, I've got it, and that wasn't it, or that it's supposed to something else that was even worse. This happens all the time with professional people. Either that or these guys are professional. It could be that, I suppose, but uh, this is not something that happens just to the student. This happens all the time. So the trick is to use approaches that make these not so bad, right? So, so they don't kill you, right? How to fall down gracefully, how to avoid hurting yourself. Um, so we're going to talk about some of these techniques that we use. Uh, one that's sort of almost a given is increasing mastery in the language, um, software engineering in general, so data structures, all those things around beyond this one. So that helps you understand the syntax helps you prevent just making a mistake to begin with, um, helps you understand what the compiler tells you, gives you experience on how to debug efficiently, all those things. So that's a big part, and that's what you guys are working on now in your classes. Another thing we use a lot is peer review. So this is everybody watching each other's back, right? Um, and all the companies I've been to, this is a hit or miss whether or not they've used it or used it effectively. 
there's quite a range of how um, deep you want to go into here, from a desk check or a code walkthrough that's very informal and quick um, to a very formal, everybody's prepared ahead of time with their notes and they have a scribe and talk about what's going on. But regardless, whenever we have used it, it's always been effective and it's helped us uh, from making mistakes. Or in particular, we make mistakes if we find them before they hurt us down the road. So in the extreme programming methodology, they take the things that work well and take it to the extreme. So take peer review, peer review works great. Let's do it all the time, like as we're writing the code. Right? That's fair programming. Um, I'm not necessarily a big proponent of all the extreme programming pieces, but I am a big proponent of fair programming. We use it quite a bit. Um, and there's a, a synergy that happens with fair programming where you get more than two people's output out of code, right? It's not like, oh, they could have both worked on something separately and would have had twice as done. The working together, you get the code out faster and it's back, there's less having to revisit that code later because while one guy was typing, the other guy was thinking about the ramifications of what was going on, different design approaches, um, all that sort of stuff. I don't think catching the stupid typos. Unit testing, um, automated tests to catch the mistakes as early as we can. So we're going to focus on this. Um, and uh, there's going to be a theme around unit testing, like writing the code and running the code. Right. Running the code before you have the rest of the system for it. Right. So now you have the code. Source control, so this is like get SDN. I'm kind of curious, how many of you guys use source control? That's oh, pretty good. Uh, maybe there used to be almost nobody out of college that ever messed with it. Um, so we've seen more of it. Things like GitHub probably help with this quite a bit. Um, we primarily use Git at this point. Um, I have seen, when I was doing support, big, famous companies with send us code where they were doing source control by having dated folders in, in the directory. And they would just copy all the code and give it a take, and that's what it was in. Right? And I can't believe this. A Fortune 500 company developer is doing that. But very important, obviously, lots of ways to keep you from falling down there is catching mistakes, fixing mistakes um, early on. Continuous integration, um, this is uh, usually some type of server system that allows multiple people to use their code continuously. So developer A finishes his task, checks it in, the system will detect it, it checks in, will build it and run tests automatically, catch it early that I failed to integrate with my cohort's code. So the, the point of all this, obviously, um, is to write better code, or write the code faster, and um, to, uh, and if you were to go down the stairs, um, at least go down the stairs gracefully and not break yourself, right? That's the whole point. All right, that's some high-level stuff. Um, and like I said, I'm just going to really focus on unit testing from here on out. But I'm happy to talk about any of the rest of this stuff, questions or thoughts or anything. Okay, but any questions at this point actually before going to the unit testing or thoughts? All right. How many of you have done unit testing? A couple of people? Okay. So, what is unit testing? There's some terminology here. Um, these are going to be sort of pedantic definitions. They're used pretty loosely, these terms for integration and unit and functional test. But I'm going to be pedantic here initially and then talk about how I feel about that. Um, unit test is a very granular, small test done in isolation. So it's testing a function in your class, right? Or maybe a couple of functions together in class with their uh, interactions. It's very granular. And then you move up less granular with functional, it's taking some of these components, these units, and putting them together. How do they work? Um, and you get there's some ambiguity there. Those couple of components together uh, might form a unit. So sometimes people we'll talk about that still as a unit test. It hasn't become big enough for them to think of it as functional. That's kind of some of the spectrum that we go through. On the far other end, uh, integration tests are that full stack from beginning to end. Um, in the you really view integration test is the full stack. We're talking about you have your database, your messaging queues, and like a whole QA system or staging system that you can test everything. Um, 
in the terms of how it's sloppy, sometimes you can have a subsystem that talks about testing it in the end as integration tests, and we actually do that. Um, in fact, mostly the terms I use are that I need it for integration, and that's more or less the line, maybe somewhere in the middle, but it's the granular isolation, how things work together, like subsystem. Subsystem can pull in the end. Um, when I use the term unit test, I, in particular, I'm leaning toward it's a small, it's done in isolation. But regardless of all of these things, what's really critical is makes them useful for uh, the on downstairs problem is that they're all automatic. They run by a push of a button or by the triggering of an event. Um, that's isolated, granular, and automatic are the, the main features of a unit test. So how do we write this? When do we write these? Um, one thing you'll hear a lot about is test-driven development. And I think you mentioned uh, that earlier. But this is another extreme programming sort of that's been out. I can't bet extreme programming guy. Um, with this view, you write the test first, right? So this, this is not giving you know, the full weight to what the whole book is about. But the idea is you write the test before you write the code. Right? Write the test. The tests fail because there's no code, right? uh, and then you write the code until you get the test pass. Right? So there's kind of this red and green. Right? I write it, the system's red, and it's red and green. And it has some advantages about your API is designed uh, at the beginning because your code that you write first uses the API. Right? I'm a proponent of test driven development in a sense. I think the advantages of it. Um, I get mostly without necessarily being as idealistic as always writing the code first. I think what's important is writing the code in conjunction, the test code with the, the production code. Now, I find sort of in practice, not many people actually do test driven development in that sense, uh, but they do it when they talk about it or people don't like it or lean toward it. They're just disciplined to create a test as they go. So you might create a little test here and sort of the functions here and then kind of go back and forth. I find the farther I get with my test, um, the more mature the code becomes, the more likely I am to write the test first, or some version of the test first. Um, and you see that in particular with debugging. So you have a problem, you can recreate the problem with a unit test, and then you get it fixed in the uh, And even if you discover what the bug is, it's usually handy to create the unit test that fails before you fix it so that you know that that unit test will catch the bug if it regresses. Right. Um, sometimes I also find I'm going to have a little demo of this where. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, they had a scheduled power outage for the oh, day. Okay. No. We're going to have to turn it back on. Is it going to happen? <laughs> uh, but okay, so test driven development. I think um, you were talking about about say I use it. Oh, as the project matures, you get oh, more and more. You get more writing the test first. Uh, debugging in particular, um, and adding new features. Right, I know I want to add this one thing. All right, so um, many languages have assertions built into them, right? And so you can build up your own test of your code. And, uh, you know, there's examples of like a class will have a test function. Just put a test function on it, you can run that and test your class, right? Um, I think that's useful to kind of get into the idea of how assertions work in um, some simple testing, but really you want to use a test framework. And the, the real value in the test framework um, are the test runners, because that's what makes it push button, that automatic part, right? So you want something that uh, also is integrated with your ID. So this is uh, the GDP unit uh, tab on Eclipse, right? So I'm in Eclipse, I'm typing my code, I can finish it a bit, and hit the button and test it to make sure the bar stays green, doesn't turn red, I'm keeping it green, things like that. I also want to integrate it into that continuous integration environment I'm talking about. We use something called Jenkins every time uh, we check something into our master branch. Jenkins runs and if uh, the tests fail, person that made this event gets an email, I get an email, and it turns red on the dashboard. Right? And they are shamed. Uh, 
um, going back there. Um, you need to be able to easily specify the test, right? So when you write your own test, if you build your own framework, it's less likely to think about how do I label a set of groups uh, with a name, a test suite, or how do I filter groups, that sort of thing. And that may be too small, but um, this is a pine test, which we'll look at a little bit, but I can uh, give it the dash k bond uh, option, and it'll only run the test that have bond in the name, right? So in this case, it ran two, and didn't run 326. That's why I picked out just a few. That's important, but all these other things kind of work nicely together. Um, so test runners is one of the things to focus on uh, and how they integrate in one of the test framework that has a nice ecosystem out there so that you can uh, plug it into the tools that you use. Um, and you'll be able to um, uh, test all the time. Right? That's it. Just, uh, that bit of building it as you go. Create the test as you go, test over the development sort of ideas, run the test every time you make a change. Right? So make something, I think this should work, run the test. If it doesn't, then fix it. That's the, you slip down one step, but don't keep going down, fix it now. Certainly before you commit it for other people to use, run the test so that you won't be shamed by uh, Jenkins. Um, and of course, for any of that work, the test should be fast. Um, you want to get into this mode cycle of make changes, run the test, make changes, run the test, what's working, fix it, run the test, it's fixed, right? And get in a nice flow, uh, coding flow. And once you get into those coding flows, um, you're writing the test, you're running the code, right? You're writing the code, you're running the code. Uh, there's a sense of completion, a sense of flow, a sense of uh, sort of mad keyboarding, I'm getting lots done, right? Uh, a master of my computer. I, these guys haven't seen this presentation, but you made a reference to this very scene out of Ghost in the Shell earlier today. Yes. Yeah. Kyle shared that. Um, one of the most popular framework out there, our family of frameworks, is the XUnit frameworks. Um, so JUnit for Java is very popular. Um, and yeah, so the C++ unit, I think uh, Perl has an XUnit thing. Um, Python uses unit tests, which is an XUnit uh, family of testing. But all the test frameworks work more or less the same way. You have some setup, right? So you'll have a class, you'll have a setup a method um, or set of functions uh, that sets up the environment for your unit, right? Whatever your unit needs uh, to be set up, it will do that. Uh, that environment's a fixture. Um, actually, most of our tests, we don't even need it. Um, so it's an optional piece. And then you write your code that you know, exercise your code and then make assertions against it to see if it did the right thing. Um, and then sometimes you have to tear down the fixture, um, particularly if you're opening files to read in test data or database and you want to disconnect and close the files. Um, that's also optional. But the, the basic life cycle is setup gets run before each test, not one time, but before each test, and then tear down is run after each test so that each unit is isolated from the rest. Uh, at least in the XUnit world. Uh, I have a little sign bit because uh, I was actually impressed with this book. I think this is the only sort of book I mentioned too much here. Um, well, test in development. But test in G for the Java users is a really interesting testing framework. Um, it doesn't quite have the inertia as JUnit. Um, and so, at least when I last used it, which was some time ago, it wasn't as integrated in all the IDs and same level. Uh, but the, the book, um, it goes through why it differs from JUnit or the XUnit stuff. It explains a lot of this is a decision I made because of this problem or that problem, or this was important to test, this wasn't, this was valuable. And so it's a nice book to look deep into what unit tests should do and how they should do them. And um, he has rants in it <coughs> about uh, mocking out um, complex systems. Um, so it's an interesting book to read even if you don't use testing G, and if you're in Java, testing G is, is a pretty nice framework. Um, so one last thing before we get into looking at some demo stuff to get a feel for what it means to you know, write the code and have an assertion. Um, I mentioned setting up a fixture. Sometimes your unit will depend on some external library or external interface, um, so web frameworks or databases or messaging queue, all those kind of things. Um, and they can be difficult to set up, right? They can be fragile, they can be all dominoes just right, and then if it's 
after you run the test, you've got to clean them up and do it again. Um, that's something you don't want to mess with, and that's something you shouldn't have to test, right? It's not your code that uh, you're testing when you have to deal with making sure those are all correct. So you just take them out. Um, and in the terminology, there's two types of ways to take it out. And these terms are actually fairly sloppily used as well. Um, but if you get pedantic about it, and there's a nice uh, Martin Fowler article about this. Um, a stub is basically a class that you create that you know, has the same interface of whatever you're trying to take out here, and you just code it yourself to do whatever you want it to do. Okay. Um, so it's not necessarily literally hard-coded, but more like a hard-coded replacement for the thing. It can have more functions than that, but that's the idea. Versus mocks, which is usually indicates a whole framework that lets you, in the framework, specify so in your setup, I want, say, the mock class to implement this interface, like the database interface, and I'm going to call this method and give it a query. So this is the query I want to give it. Right? So you'll have this step. Uh, you know, use this interface. I'm going to call this method with this input. You respond with this output. I'm going to call again with this next input. You respond with this output. And then it's all set up to run. Right? You kind of primed it, and then when you're in your test, it'll call those things and get those responses back out. Um, so the more complex the API, the more that's valuable to be able to set up and use that over and over. And it can give you some uh, additional validation. So most of these mock libraries have methods to verify that my unit that I'm tested did call all these methods and it called them in the right order. Right? So you can make sure that your unit interacted with the third party uh, bit. So this is about as advanced as I'm going to get. I'm not going to talk about test suites or anything else, but um, this is the first thing you get is, oh, I've, I've got this bit that I kind of use, and I don't really want to set up a web server just to test this one thing, so stub it out or create a mock class. Okay, so I'm going to do some demos. The, the demos is non-professional. It's amateur code, right? <laughs> It's just to display some of this, and hopefully, kind of quick about it. We're going, mm, that's not bad. Um, in, in addition, if I go through this, I'm not looking obviously for you guys to say, "Oh, now I can go write Python and Python unit tests to hit high levels of what it means in practice." Right? To get some concreteness to all those other little topics. Um, so, let's go be stupid pretend code. Let's do a pretend stupid thing. We're going to have some code for it. Um, Portal gun, yeah. and it's, it's not actually even as fun as that is when we get into it, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> All right, so here's my terminal, so I work at Red Hat, so this is Linux, this is a bash terminal, at a bash prompt, it's a fairly elaborate bash prompt, but it's just a bash prompt. Um, I'm in my project portal gun, like, obviously. Um, and this is a Python project. How many have used Python? I know Python, so quite a few people have a little bit of Python, right? Uh, that just means I'm going to be more embarrassed by how crappy this code is. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, what I have here is the, the portal gun itself. That's the main thing here that runs everything. Uh, portal, this is by imagining it as sort of a, a library that handles all the hard quantum dimensional uh, work. And then the address book, which is a mapping of uh, dimension IDs, uh, it's a dimension name basically in this case, uh, but you know, there's a whole bunch of dimensions you can go to in the multiverse, and so you have to have some list of those. Right, so let's, uh, just to get going here, we'll look at the, uh, the gun. Oops, I'll just let this try again. <laughs> um, so Python, scripting language is going to start here. Let's go through here, do some imports, uh, here's a definition function, hey great, I know what this function is. Uh, now I've actually got some code I'm going to execute. Um, uh, we're going to initialize a dimension, dimension ID with a default, CU137. Uh, I'm going to check my command line arguments, and if I've got, uh, well essentially if I've got one in addition to, um, or at least one in addition to the command itself, I'm going to use that as the dimension ID. So default, but you specify one of the command lines. Not a lot of good checking here, but again, this is amateur stuff. And then I'm going to open the portal, 
and opening the portal to sys pretend that we're just going to print basically the text out of it. Um, so we can run this uh, sort of thing here. Um, We open the portal to the Cronenberg uh, dimension, <laughs> um, and we can give it. Uh, uh, let's see, one thirty-two. Uh, go back to the dimension, uh, the home dimension, and the comic for forty. Um, all right, that works. Uh, we move test it. Works, works great. Um, let's look at the address book now. Uh, so, very simple. Uh, an address object. Uh, normally, I actually just use a dictionary here. Um, I had some different ways I thought I might do some tests. I have a class here, but so an address object that has two members, a dimension ID, and a description. Um, I have some default addresses. Uh, that, and, yeah, that's what your portal come, comes with when you first unbox it. And then I have an unknown address uh, in case nothing matches. So we'll see what that means out here. And the constructor, I basically, you know, I've got this comprehension thing, but basically I'm reading these in and creating a map or a dictionary keyed by the dimension ID and value of the address. So I'll have D500A. And then I'll have the address object that has both of these in it as the values that I need. Um, I'm going to make this a little more. That's still something you can read pretty easily back there. Um, have a, you know, this address book or object um, or class basically wraps a Python dictionary. So I have a get. Um, and the get either you know returns the address associated with the ID, or if that ID doesn't exist in the map, uh, returns the unknown address. So it's a little safer. Um, add an address to it, so it's just adding a new address uh, to the addresses uh, member, and then it is known. And probably won't mess with these, depending on what questions you ask, I might play around with them, but um, I just threw some functions out there to ask. So we're going to start with testing this, um, because I thought this was the easiest thing to talk about the test with. Um, let's look at the test. So I've got two tests already written. Uh, we're going to unit test. Um, so I mentioned Python unit test as an X unit type of framework. Um, I got to import some stuff to test, but I define a test class and it has test function. So the test runners. Um, and you see this in a lot of languages. In, in Python, most of them take the convention that I'm going to look for modules that start with test, and I'm going to run functions that have test and test underbar. Um, very nice convenient to make it easy. Obviously, you can configure these things to be fancier things and look for other types of names. Um, but as we'll see when I run the test, by just following this convention, it all magically gets wired together. All right, so we're going to test add address. Um, so to add the address, I'm going to do two things here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to we'll here in a second, but basically I'm going to show that it's not there first. When I try to get it unknown, and then I'm going to put it in there and show that it's in there. So create an address book, get a new ID, so pi t14, the circle dimension, obviously. Um, and I get the result out. I haven't added it yet. The new ID, I should get unknown. Right? So the result, I'm asserting that uh, this argument, the result dimension ID, is equal to this argument. We'll see some more of these functions in a second. I add the new one. I get the result by calling get address for that same ID. Uh, and then I assert that the dimension ID from the result is the same as one test. Pretty simple, right? Maybe way too simple. Maybe it's too simple. But regardless, um, let's go over here and run the test. I'm going to use PyTest. 
Um, there's several testing uh, runners in Python, high test, nose test, probably some of the two big ones. Um, and uh, probably definitely high test. So I mentioned there's two, I have the test gun, test already kind of stuff out. Um, but I went through and found all these tests without maybe specifying anything. There's no configuration files, just starting the hidden tree and looking for these things. And it runs in the label. We're off to a good start. So now we're going to make changes to this code. Um, so we're going to do some of the test driven development, as it were. Um, so what I'm thinking is, okay, let's. What are some cases? Uh, and, and, well, what are other cases, please? Oops. I put one in the All right. Um, and the add function that we haven't taken. To account. So what if you pass none into the add function? Um, well, what's the behavior we want in, in the case we pass none? There's two, two possibilities. One is, well, I ask this function to add none to it, which is just not doing anything. Right. The other approach is, it's dumb to add it to tell it to add none. And so that should be an API mistake. And I should raise an error and say, hey, you're using me incorrectly. Right. Uh, both of those could be valid. It depends on how you actually expect your API to be used. Uh, the first case is really easy, so, though, um, and we'll do a test for it here. So I'm going to test first, um, test, add none, none being the null value in, in Python. Right? So let's see here, we got the result. Well, actually, how will we know if it worked or not? Um, so if we add none, it wouldn't be clear what the ID would be or anything like that. So maybe we should check the length of our uh, dictionary, right? So what's the dictionary before? Afterwards, it should be the same. So uh, what's our original link off when we address both of them? Create a new address book. And now get the original link. So now we want to add none. And uh, assert oh, that cell. All right, so let's talk here for a second. Um, I mentioned most languages have an assert. Python has an assert. And actually, particularly with high test, you can just use asserts and it will build reports out of that and know what to do. About it. Um, but if you use the framework, you have all these nice helper functions to help you with your assertions, right? To keep you from building out functions on how you're comparing objects. So there's obvious assert that's equal or equals, that's what we've been using, assert that certain uh, uh, errors are raised, almost equal, right? So this is looking at plugging point things, um, and so on and so on. We're going to leave very basic here and just use assert equals. So that uh, the link of uh, the address objects. So the addresses, addresses member is equal to original. Right. Like that. All right. That makes sense. What's going on there? Everybody following? So uh, we run the test, and uh, what do we expect here? Failure, right? Because we didn't write any code to handle that. Now, sometimes you do this sort of thing and you get lucky if this happened and none you do the right thing. It's kind of nice case. But usually it, it, we failed. Right? So we slipped down a step, although we meant to in this case, um, because we need to test for the development that we were going to go grant. Um, and even the, the error here, none type object is not dimension ID that even makes sense, right? Because we pass in. Now into our function, it's going to try to set the dimension ID in this topic here. So let's go fix the, fix the code. Address. So, um, in 
Python none is faulty, so if not none, is what we're looking at here. So if it is none, we're just going to return. We're not going to do anything. Very simple. <coughs> We have to be tested, right? So, let's see. We have time. We need time here to talk about a few more of these uh, ideas. Uh, if we go back to the test, um, this is really a silly use of it, but um, it gets the basic idea out. So, I've got creating an address book here, creating an address book here. That's sort of fixture like the environment I need and then the address book. So we can put that up in a setup. So maybe we uh, the term dried up our code a little bit. Dry, you're not familiar with that term. Don't repeat yourself. Code have lots of copy paste sort of looking thing. Um, we got to make sure that we actually call the new attribute though. So here, here, here. I think I got all of them. If I don't, please. So that shouldn't have changed anything, right? We've improved our code um, uh, very marginally, maybe in this case. And we see this test is so fast. That's actually uh, a very useful uh, example in the sense that I went through here and said, oh, I think the code would be better and cleaner if I moved this up to this section. But I was able to make a change and then no, I didn't introduce any new bugs. So if the code gets more and more complicated, that becomes much more important. That's one of the major uh, features of unit tests. And one of the reasons you see it uh, really height and uh, extreme programming in the agile area is because you want to refactor all the time. But you can't do that if you're afraid you're going to do this bug or you can't tell if you're bug. OK. So one more quick thing, um, if we say uh, have a test over here um, for the, uh, the portal gun itself, um, so I'm testing that activate portal method, and so essentially uh, I, I run the function activate portal, I'm getting the gate out, and then I'm seeing from it merge, isn't it? So a very simple test, we know it's passed uh, here. Right? Um, if we're thinking, I guess, pretending this is a portal gun, it means every time we run this test, we're opening a portal, right? Um, that probably run our battery down, right? We don't really want to do that every time. So this is a case where you want to uh, have a mop or a stub. So we'll do a quick stub. Um, and this will also highlight how do I make this testable, right? So how am I going to introduce the stub? If I'm going to have a stub, that means um, I have to be able to tell it what portal to use, right? Um, or what portal function to use. So um, I just want to go fast on the gun. Right? So if I'm going to use a different one in this function, I've got to pass it in. So what did I do here? Make sure we're understanding. So down here, when I call it, I'm going to pass in the function that I imported from the portal. 
right? And so I'm going to pass in the function, which I can just use in Python as just a function, and then I'm going to call it here. So if I did everything right, this would still work just as it has, right? So I can verify it, it still works just as it has because I have unit test that this uh, uh, function. So in my test, whoa, I messed up. Oh, I didn't change my unit test. I went the opposite way that time. Let's go fix that. Activate portal takes two arguments. Uh, I think I misread that. Four. Uh, what do we got going on here? Activate portal, two arguments. Two arguments. Go back to the test. And the open gate to set up the portal. What's that? Open gate to set up the portal is the second argument. You fell off of a skateboard? What? No, I fell down the stairs. <laughs> there. We go. By the way, there's another little trick there. Um, I can't, well, other than I should have listened to what Jesse said. Uh, we have some static code analysis going automatically in our, our, our editor to determine that something was wrong. Now, now ah, okay, we're back to what we wanted to. Okay. So, now, that was all to set it up so that I could use a mop. I didn't use a mop. I'm still actually opening gates. Uh, right? I'm opening dimensions everywhere. Every node was leaking out and we are reversed by doing that. Uh, so now we want to uh, use a mop. So we need to create a mop. So let's just go to the actual portal and grab out the code from that and just change it a bit. <coughs> See the very elaborate uh, portal code. So instead of uh, the dashes, these arrows, we'll just put this to indicate that it's a different one. Test.
we're still green and we didn't open any portals. Right? Actually, maybe we should. Uh, well, we can just approve. Make sure you don't leave any. You wouldn't actually do the system just to show that it's using another function. Yeah. Yeah, that's silly because um, so that's kind of the idea of a mock. The idea is that uh, I want to substitute something for the real thing and I don't want to run the batteries down. Um, notice to use a mock, often your code will have to be written so you can't you have to have a way to substitute in the mock. Right? Uh, there are some uh, libraries in Python. Uh, particularly in modern dynamic languages, that will go monkey patch a mock for you, so it will go change the code on the fly. Um, and then thanks to like Java, it's like that. Right here. All right. So, question comes up what should you test? Right. And you often hear particularly XP so stuff, everything. Everything? I, I don't think everything. Uh, a lot of it. And you should write the test as you go and all that. But what would you might want to consider not testing? So when you're debugging stuff, one of the phrases you might hear is select isn't broken. You ever heard that? So the idea is that you think there's a bug, you can't figure it out. It's like the select in my C compiler must be broken. That's all I can do. No, select isn't broken. You have some subtle logic bug. It's not select. That's been tested very heavily by logic. That's what applies uh, in unit tests. I don't test parts of the language itself, right? Um, and there's some variations here. So one of the things that I usually avoid is like just setting numbers and checking that what came out of the site. The setting the value and checking is going to work. Now, sometimes there's an API layer there. You say, well, I'll make sure this API works this way. I may substitute that for a function layer, not just for the um, In a normal agile approach, I'd say, well, I'll test it once you get there. But maybe there's some wiggle room there. But for the most part, I don't test the language itself. The next layer is similar, is don't test third party libraries. Right? That's, they should be testing those for using the library. But there's also edge cases there. Sometimes they do have bugs. Uh, sometimes you want to ensure that the API that you depend on doesn't change, and so you write test that. But for the most part, don't bother testing the hybrid library. Legacy code is kind of a tricky thing. So you have a bunch of code that doesn't have tests. How do I do this? My experience so far, and interesting about this really is okay, start with automating it so you get it in an automatic build system. Start making changes and know whether or not you work or not. Those are usually a high level of an integration test uh, or functional test. Because when you start writing just a unit test to have a unit test, you start needing to move the code around to make it easier. If it didn't have any tests, you go to testing right well. I don't have anything I tested, it's just one giant function. I gotta set everything up to try to use it. But once you start making those changes, you start introducing bugs, which you can't tell because you don't have any tests to tell So start at the top in that sense, have those integration tests that start giving you some uh, you know, support on that there to catch you, and then add the unit test as you have to go fix other bugs. And bugs are a great way to do it. Here's a bug in the code, write a unit test, fix that bug, fix it. Now I've got a unit test for this code. And then there's always understanding the cost of test code. And this is an interesting uh, bit when you start thinking about the architecture and how costly it makes to test and the complexity of third party dependencies for like message queues and databases are really hard to test when they're buried in the code. Um, and so the advice that I've gotten to instead of worrying too much about mocks and stuff, sometimes you have to do that. But Try to get the code so that you don't have to test them at all. And I'll talk about that over here. And the benefits of unit testing, you get better code because it should be correct. That's the main uh, point of writing the thing, right? That's, I tested it and it works. But you also get better encapsulation because to test it, you have to have the logic you want to test in something that you can call. And a better API, so that's better. It's easier to understand the code because it's uh, better encapsulated and has a better API. And the test server is examples. So kind of figure out, well, how does this work? I've got the documentation. I probably don't because I forgot to write the documentation. No, it's way out of date. 
Um, I can go look at the task and make it run, so I know that they're correct. I can see examples of input, output, bad input, but the task has checked for negative conditions. Um, and I can run them. If there's any confusion, I can run it. If there's confusion about the code, not the test, right? not the input, I can run the test to test that code and set through the code itself. So I'm giving you an entry point uh, to have the code. I can run the code without the rest of the stuff. Right? I don't have to have the portal gun to look at the address book code. These are debug. As you can check through it, you can also modify the test so that they fail. I mentioned that a couple times. Alluding to in the previous slide, you get better architecture. So to make it testable, and this is one of the main motivations you see when people describe why they want to do dependency injection, uh, is to make it testable. So dependency injection is exactly what we did in that previous example with the, the portal gate. It's um, I have something I depend on. I depend on this portal library, say, right? but I may want to swap it out. So instead of me depending on it that way, I want to have my caller tell me which portal library I'm supposed to use. That's sometimes called inversion control. And in Java, there's a huge popular framework called Spring. Its whole purpose is dependency injection, turning everything around so that you specify these dependencies in a declarative fashion uh, so you can swap them out. And then uh, clean architecture, this is something actually that Chris uh, told me about a couple weeks ago, a month ago. Um, and that testing the ebook actually talks about it a little bit when that comes to that. Um, but this is another turning things inside out. This is putting the framework in the I.O. at the top of your class. Um, so it's not buried down in the bottom to be mocked out, right? So you end up having code that you have things at the top. Um, so you say you're using a Java messaging queue, and that's really hard to test because you have to like, type something on the queue. Instead of trying to abstract that and hide it down low, you can move it up as high as you can and you have all the code that builds up your message, put it on the queue, and all the code that does whatever comes afterwards. You can easily test these, and then you can say, well, okay, this is simple, I don't need to test that. That's someone else's responsibility. I've got the code that I want that does what I need. And I could do a little bit more, but that's really expensive and it's not worthwhile for um, So clean architecture. Um, Uncle Bob came up with that. Some, some good stuff out there. Uncle okay. Bob and Robert Martin. Uh, then the thing I mentioned before, and this is a big, big, big uh, benefit that we have actually seen on my team: safety to refactor. So uh, we have a product that has a large plugin family or set of plugins that go with it, and we change that framework and make sure you embrace all this set of plugins, lots of different people code it. What do they do? Weird, strange. Well, we can make a change and we can run all those tests and see, ah, here's a situation we didn't think about how we're going to build that. And without that, and that, I've seen this too in, in places I've been, the set of code was, uh, yeah, we can have, could fix that, but who knows what it's going to break, we're better off just leaving it alone. Right? It's almost like, I might as well not even have the source code anymore because I'm not So, as always, you need a test, write the code, run the code. Um, it still doesn't keep you from falling down the stairs, right? Um, but if you do fall down the stairs, you don't go as far, and you can get back up. And so we become masters of getting up the stairs. I guess, I guess I have a question, sure. So I know a lot of people, like their first time looking at any kind of unit testing, especially TDD, is they think that, you know, it slows down the process of development so much. And uh, I don't know, I guess how would you argue against that? Other than the fact that you so, can, you know. Okay, so there's two ways it slows it down. One is temporary, which is it's new. I gotta figure out how to do it. I gotta understand it. That's probably the first thing you really feel because it's like that's in your face, right? Almost like a blank page problem. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm learning this new language. I'm ready to go. I gotta go through the same. 
once you get past that, it slows you down if you're writing some code, but in the end of the project, you're speaking up because you catch all these mistakes very quickly. And you'll make lots of mistakes. Um, so it's, it's really keeping you from falling off, too. Uh, that write the code and run the code. If you're building a big system, I mean, say you're starting on a big system, so I'm going to have to have this base level address book class. Uh, got it. Write the unit test and make sure it's all working and done what you think and test out if you design that class. Or you can wait for three or four weeks when you get the rest of it and plug it in. If there's a bug then, you'll pull this other stuff around. And now it all works. Hmm. Um, so in the end, it saves you a lot of time. And then when you go to make changes at your factory, it saves you a lot of time. Um, and I think even psychologically, you can seem to go faster even though running more code and that you know, mm -hmm. the flow of uh, Run, you know, run, test, maybe even check in, run, test, check in. So you can get source control, right? And have your traffic change you make and make those reversible kind of time machines for your code. Um, yeah. That's all I'm going to look at So if I hear you guys right, like without testing, it's like going four steps forward and ten steps back versus if you do test, then it's like two steps forward and one step back. Yes. So without the test, you, you can make progress and get forward. Although maybe in the end, you end up exploding when you get the right? But, you know, you, even if you don't, you don't hear you guys. It's like, oh my god, that was terrible. We finally got there and it all works. And We have, um, in, in our current project, uh, how many thousands? Failure is over three over a year and three months. Okay, so here's our twenty-five thousand test You can see we had some failures here that we had out there, and then the rest of it didn't run because of the failure. Right. And this gets built every time someone uh, every time someone checks in goes into our master branch. In our early branch, we get built so we're up to you know, twelve thousand. So that's automatic. They get the feedback right away. We just turn red. I got an email. And uh, 
Actually, a lot of times this isn't even their fault. Someone else's fault. So they get inappropriately changed, but uh, particularly when it's something on infrastructure that's screwed up. But, um, or lots of tests. We can make changes in these plugins and they'll you know, have confidence that we will be good. And now the quality of those tests depend on the person writing those plugins. Um, so there might be some potential gaps there. Same as other projects has quite a few less, so three forty something. I had a count from here. Three thirty six. So do Question. Red Hat's become it's growing truly fast. So actually, they mentioned um, that's more than double since I started. Um, so there's some variation there. So particularly in open source upstreams. So Red Hat, you know, with Red Hat as open source company, uh, all the stuff that we push out is open source. Um, some of the contributors upstream may be more so like that's like the one guy that maintains this one level package. But for the most part, it's their team will be connected. My team, so these guys, they work remote um, from the other homes around here. The guy in Kansas, the guy in Texas, and the guy in North Carolina that's on the directly important to me as their manager. Then we have a team in Beijing, um, and we have a couple of friends in you know, India. Um, they all work pretty closely together. Now, day to day, we don't work with those guys necessarily one on one, but these guys are a pair program. So when I was doing the demo stuff, so this terminal, I'm using QMUX. So I this is something called screening, which you get in you're not familiar with, but it's a, uh, it's a terminal emulator. And I actually have another version of the terminal here. So it's not mirrored, this is just the same terminal. Uh, so these guys will get on the QMUX on their various computers and they'll all share a terminal and work. So, and that's how we do up their programming. You know, it's a very low bandwidth. 